Welcome, Dr. Finn, to the show. You have written a book that's over 500 pages on habits, the habit mechanic. I've got it right here for those of you that look on the video, which is amazing. And I'm really glad to have you on the show. Will you please talk to the audience here, explain what led you to write the book and um, what you're looking to achieve through this book, and then we'll dive in. Well, thank you for having me, David, and thank you to everyone for listening. It only took me 20 years to write, so maybe 500 plus pages isn't all that impressive if you divide it by 20 plus years. But (laughs) yeah, I was always very good at playing sport, and I went to university to study sports science, and I got the chance to play high-level rugby at university. And I found myself in a a warm-up game for an international match in the north of England on a cold, wet, windy day. And I was playing fullback, which means you have to catch high balls. And I just found myself under this very high ball coming down at me, two opposition players closing me down very quickly. Uh, I was about 19 years old. We were playing a a men's professional team. And all I could think was, don't drop the ball, don't drop the ball, don't drop the ball, you're going to drop the ball. And I didn't even drop the ball. I completely missed it. I mean, I just missed the ball. They scored a try. I got substituted. I didn't get selected for the next game. And I was kicking myself because at the time I was studying sports psychology. So it was a bit of a wake-up call about getting more into the studies. And then around that time, I'd also sustained quite a bad injury. So I'd ruptured one of my quad muscles in my right leg, which meant that I couldn't really train anymore and couldn't play high-level rugby. So I decided that I was going to work in performance psychology. If I couldn't be on the field, I was going to help people that were. And I really got my um, teeth stuck into sports psychology. I wanted to do a master's in sports psychology. And I went to work in elite sport. Eventually, I did my PhD and created Tougher Minds. And all the all the things that you see in the book, that mirrors my journey. And I, and I talk about my journey in the book. But all, the, all these ideas in The Habit Mechanic, they've, they've been worked on literally over the past 20 years, tried, refined. Uh, and, and I knew from, I had that instinct right from the start when I was learning about this stuff, is that the education I got was very good at helping you to know what people should be doing and help people to know what they should be doing. But there wasn't an awful lot in there about actually helping them to do it better. And helping them to change their behavior and there still isn't so i was very passionate about taking the neuroscience how brains work taking the behavioral science what drives what we do and putting that into simple and practical things people could use every day to build better habits so that's what the book's about yeah you know what i found interesting about the book so my first thought was when i saw you know your name you were presented to us a possible guest and, and I thought, um, well, you know, we already have some pretty well-known writers, you know, about habits, you know, who've written a few books here in the States. And, and also this book is so large. I'm just like, what's this going to be like? But what I, what I like about the book is that you took the time, there's, it's over 500 pages, but you didn't make it tiny type. So it's really hard to read and I got to use a microscope. It's the spacing is really easy to read, very conversational, a lot of stories. But what I like is what you just referred to is that you helped people move beyond knowledge transfer, gaining the knowledge to actually applying it. And you have a lot of different tools in here about you can try this way, you can try that way, you can do this, and all kinds of stories. And, and I, I really like that. So have you spent a lot of your time? And I know you go into it in the book, so I think you have, but just to confirm, how much of your time has been spent really working with people to apply the knowledge versus just, you know, teaching and telling them about it? Yeah, so I I estimate that I've spent about 25,000 hours helping people to put this into practice. And that's what the book's based on. So I didn't just sit down and write a book from scratch. It's all that stuff that we teach. In the book, there are over 30 habit mechanic and chief habit mechanic tools. And it probably, David, it's probably not fair to call it a book. It is a manual. It's designed to be a manual for life. <laughs> Something that you don't just read once. This is not written by a journalist who studied habits for three years and said they're an expert. You can't be an expert in habits in three years. Um, this, is, this is written by someone who's lived and this is all I've ever done in my professional career. 
And you don't just read a book and build better habits. It's about repetition and refinement and trial and error and personal research. So this is a guide. It's a manual that you can keep coming back to, revisiting things, things that when you first look at it, might not find you might not find that appealing to your life right now, but I guarantee you at some point in your life, you will want to get better at managing stress or being more productive or being a better leader because our life is a journey. And the way we express this in the book, as you'll see, David, is if, well, life is a journey, it has ups and downs and as experienced business leaders, we understand that. What have mechanic approach isn't a magic fix. It, it means two broad things. When you're on an up, You've got a much better sense of where you are. Are you really at the peak? Can you push yourself further? Do you need to take your foot off the pedal a little bit and recharge the batteries? And when you're on a down, you recognize it faster. So you're able to stop yourself falling as far and resurrect your better habits or build some new habits to get yourself going in a, in a positive direction again. So if we understand our habits and how to manage them, we're going to be much better able to really accelerate things when they're going well, but also decelerate when they're not going so well and get back onto a positive track. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious where to go. I'm struggling where to go here because I'm thinking, I want to talk about your book for a moment. Uh, one of the things you talk about is you talk about practicing to perform and you put in something from the, the lessons of King George the sixth. And what was in the movie. And I enjoyed that movie. I mean, it's not like a riveting movie, but I really enjoyed it. And, and the actor who played the king um, is fantastic. So, um, but I, I really liked what you pointed out here that when Lionel Logue was brought in as a speech therapist, because the king was stuttering and that was his problem, right? And, and maybe you want to tell the story, but I, I love the fact that you brought out, which I don't rem I didn't remember from the movie. Okay. But you brought out where he said, he, first of all, he wasn't the first speech therapist. But when he came in, he met with him, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, okay, well, here's the deal. Um, you, he, he said, you really have to work hard. He's, or, or here, I can cure you, but it will need a tremendous effort from you. Without that effort, can't be done. So he kind of laid it down. Boom. It, I, can, I can do this. But... I can only do my part. You got to do your part. And then the, I love the way you outlined the five things that he forced the king to do that were practicing to perform in the environment where he had to perform. And that's most people don't do that. All these coaches and that type of thing. So do you, do you want to expand on that or talk about that, that type of thing? Because this is, I, I think this is huge. Yeah. So. I was very lucky to study with some pretty prolific scientists through my three psychology related degrees I've got. And I was lucky when I was doing my master's that it was right at the time when functional MRI scanners became cheap enough that people could afford them to use research. And actually at that time, uh, all the papers we were reading were, came from France because the French government had invested a lot in functional MRI scanners. So all the researchers there could use them. So it was the first time we could start to see inside the brain in real time. And one of the professors I worked with, he, his area was imagery. And I, that was my area as well for my undergraduate degree. And I went to that to study with him specifically. And he was looking at imagery practice at a, on a brain level. And he worked out that actually, if you wanted to really supercharge imagery practice, and just as a simple example, let's take golf, you know, imagining hitting that great drive down the first fairway, that your imagery practice was going to be much more powerful if you activated the same neurons in your brain when you were imagining the golf shot as actually were being fired when you hit the golf shot. And that's called functional equivalence. So we have to make sure that when we're practicing to perform, we've got to fire the same neural circuitry in our brain as when we're actually performing. And that's why that King's speech example is so powerful. And it, it is a movie, it's based on a true story. And there's a lot of insight you can glean that isn't in the movie. So I created the TTAP model. And I also actually created, so I worked a lot in professional golf in my early career. And I worked for the Professional Golfers Association of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
So if you want to be a PGA pro in the UK, you literally have to do a degree in golf. And about 15 years ago, that, that degree typically had three, well, it had three components. It had, you learned how to manage a shop and a business. You learned how to coach people, the golf swing, you know, the physical parts of playing golf. And you learned how to build and repair golf clubs. Then they introduced a fourth component about 15 years ago, which was sports science. And I was working with them and they said, can you create the golf psychology module? We need the golf psychology module. And of course, psychology is really an intangible thing. So how do you make what's going on in the golfer's brain really physical and really tangible? So I created this tool called the pre-shot training system, where essentially it's big colored squares that you map out on the floor. And in, in the colored squares, you map out your thoughts before you hit the golf ball, as you're hitting the golf ball, and after you've hit the golf ball. So that meant that, because if you, if, you if you think of driving range golf, it's like a different sport to playing golf when you start to understand the importance of functional equivalence in practice. So it allows the golfers, when they're practicing, to actually replicate the thinking process more closely to what actually happens when they're playing, and also practice a more consistent thinking process. When you're on the range, no pressure, it's fine, I'm fantastic, I'm nailing the shot every time. All of a sudden, it's the first tee, everyone's watching, or it's that put I need to hold out to win the game. My brain starts to go crazy. So if we start to practice that thinking process, we've got a better chance of controlling it under pressure. So that's where the T-top, the T-tap piece emerges from. Um, and in that chapter, I also talk about Johnny Wilkinson, a very fit, almost think of the David Beckham of the rugby world, how he created his pre-shot routine. He, Johnny Wilkinson was actually in the dissertation of one of my students who was also an international goal kicker. He was interviewing all these people. So yeah, so we all these areas that sound very simple in the book, I've gone quite deep into them, you know, from a research perspective. But I think it's important to create language like TTAP learning just to make it simple to apply. Yeah, well, it, it strikes me though. Um, so are you saying that if I want to work on a habit, let's say I want to work on a habit, it's um, how I'm going to run a meeting or something like that. Let's say it's how I'm going to run a meeting. You know, let's, let's say that. So are you saying that instead of me taking just time alone only and thinking about, okay, I want to develop this habit, whether I do that once a day, once a week, several times a day, whatever it is, it sounds like what you're saying is that what I would be better off doing is to define the habit that I want to develop and maybe the process of the habit. But then when I, when I, when I really want to work on it, I'm going to really be intentional when I go into my next meeting and apply that in the setting because that's where I'm going to establish the habit better than just thinking about it in the safe environment alone at my desk. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because the, the wires that are firing in, in your brain in the real situation, this is specifically important when you need to perform tasks under pressure. So that might be a presentation you've got to give to the board, David. And what you've traditionally been practicing is sitting down, practicing that presentation at home, in your home office, nice and calm, it's nice and relaxed, and just clicking through the slides that doesn't replicate what you need to do in front of the board. You'll be at a different activation level. You'll probably be stood up. The slides will be in a different position. There'll be different thoughts racing through your brain. So we've got to, whatever we want to get good at, we've got to practice that as closely as possible, you know, when, when we're practicing. And of course, the under pressure habits, which I think probably in a corporate context, presenting is, is an obvious one. Um, yeah. Get as close to that, get as close to, the real thing as possible. Not always possible to do. Um, you know, penalties in soccer are a great example. And practicing to take penalties can be challenging because it's hard to replicate 90,000 people in Wembley Stadium on a practice ground. So that's why some, you know, some managers over the years have, after the semi finals, they've held their players back whilst the crowd's still in the ground and practice the penalties, for example. But what we can all do is we can practice the thinking process. And I think that's often invisible in habits. I think we've been conditioned by well-intentioned journalists who've written some of those other habit books you're talking about. 
that habits are about 50% of what we do and it's very physical. They're not. Physics, uh, habits are driving everything we're doing. You know, famous, fantastic um, American scientist, Daniel Dennett, who's informed by two fantastic British scientists, um, Alan Turing and Charles Darwin. Then he puts it beautifully. Imagine you've got a trillion tiny little mechanic cogs in your brain that are whirling mindlessly. That is what's going on. It's very hard for us to conceptualize what a billion moving parts looks like, but that is what's driving our behavior. And it's not just what we physically do, it's what we think. And the biggest thing that we're missing out when we're trying to perf- get better at performing under pressure is we're not practicing what we're thinking. Yeah, so so even to correct what my, what my example was, if I can go in and practice that presentation to the board in that boardroom at the time of day that I'm going to be doing it, maybe even get some friends to sit in after I've done it a few times. So I've got people there so I can really practice and, and really, I mean, if it's important, I really want to build the habit. That's what I need to do. Does that sound right? Yeah, exactly. I can, I'm pretty sure that I could present to Wembley Stadium now. Never have done it. Maybe, maybe that will happen one day. I remember distinctly my first lecture. And people say, oh, a good presenter, John, et cetera. That's not natural. I've developed those habits. I remember my first lecture when I was teaching, tiny little lecture theatre, maybe held 50 people, but there were only 10 sat in there. And I was almost shaking with nerves, you know. Now I wouldn't even flinch because I've developed the habits. So, yeah, yeah it's about focused, deliberate practice. That's key. Not all practice is equal. That, that's the misdemeanor of Ericsson's work, you know, 10,000 hours. Not all 10,000 hours are the same. You've got to put, make your practice on the edge so you're pushing yourself. And that's how you're going to speed up learning and speed up habit development. And we've got an entire chapter on the book about that. I think that may be the biggest thing that comes out of this podcast. Not all practice is equal. And that what you're teaching about uh, making it as simulated as real as possible will really help. I'm curious on the mental side. Uh, years ago, I read that Jack Nicholson, going back to professional golf, could concentrate so fully on the ball that you could fire a gun 10 feet away from him and he wouldn't even hear it. Is that is that possible? Yeah, there are all these stories. Out, and, if you, and if you dig into Jack, Nichol, uh, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholas, which one? Jack Nicholson. <laughs> It's Jack Nicholas. Yeah, it's Jack Jack Nicholas. Nicholas. I have it wrong. I had it wrong. Jack Nicholas. The the greatest golfer of all time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And I have his name wrong. Real good. So he he goes to the movies in his head and describes that very in-depth process. And if you dig into that, well, why did he do that? Well, he said, I was turned pro. I had a young family at home and I was making no money. I had to work out how to take a different approach. So he worked out the mental game himself. And he became the best golfer we've ever seen. That was an accident, almost. No one said, Jack, you know what you should do? You should imagine going to the movies in your head. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? So absorbing yourself in all that detail. Concentrate. We're always concentrating. That's how our brain works. And we only have so much capacity to, to concentrate. It's a bit like a cup. You know, you've only got so much capacity. So what Nicholson is doing is packing the cup with as much detail as possible with the things that's most helpful for him. And he's turning that into a habit. And the good news is we can all learn to do that because there's a science behind it. So all these things that we hear about super high-performing people do, we can, we can learn to do them ourselves. Not everyone was taught them in a very formal way, but we can learn them. And that's what this book's about. It's teaching you whether it's better sleep, diet, exercise. And, and all, these are, all these are interconnected. If you want to get good at hitting great golf balls, sleep, diet, exercise are essential, right? Because your brain's not going to work properly if you don't do those things well. Getting good at managing stress is essential. Getting good at managing confidence is essential. Getting good at managing your time productivity. So all the habits in the book, they're all interconnected, although they're often presented as separate ideas, they're not. They're all interconnected ideas. So they're, they're layered together. So to get to the performing well under pressure piece, you've got to understand the other parts of the jigsaw first. You know, activation, I think, is an absolute essential concept that most people have never thought about. And once they do, like, oh, wow, yeah, 
this is so helpful for everything that I'm trying to achieve in my life. We'll talk about that activation piece then for a moment. Yeah. So the reason I developed activation was because anxiety gets a bad rap. It's seen as a negative thing, but it's just a, re- it's just a human reaction. And it's not always bad. Sometimes anxiety is good. I feel a bit anxious before the presentation. Well, that's good because it means I'm ready, for example. So I wanted to have a way of explaining this activation levels that we feel in our body. So I conceptualize activation, which if you think of a dial, starts at zero, zero, goes all the way to 100. If you're at zero, zero on the dial, it means that you're dead. Okay, that's the starting point. <laughs> then if you come past zero, zero, it means you hope you're in a deep sleep. So the low numbers on the scale, you're calm, relaxed, etc. As you start to come round to the 100, your heart is beating as quickly as it can. You know, you're as activated as, as you can be. If you go over 100, you're back down to zero, zero. And for everything we do every day, there's an optimal activation level. So if you want to go to sleep tonight and you just opened your emails and you're over excited about something, you're not going to be able to sleep because you need to be down at fives, ones, right? If you want to do some really focused work, I need to be maybe at 50 or a 60, but you just had a massive lunch or you didn't sleep very well last night, you're not going to be able to do it. So if we understand activation and the optimal activation levels that we have for different tasks, like in the King George example, you know, he was going to be activated when he was giving that speech in Westminster Abbey. So in his practice, he had to match the right activation level. One of the things the All Blacks did so successfully, the All Blacks rugby team, pretty much everyone agrees they're the most successful team of all time. They understood after choking in a few World Cup uh, semi-finals that they had to get better at developing their mental game. So they, they worked on a concept very similar to activation to help them to, to stop giving away silly penalties on the field and also get themselves, in simple language, pumped up enough to be able to you know, be physical and aggressive. So they're managing their mental state throughout the course of the game, but also in training because we've got to practice in training what we want to achieve on the field. If I, the reason I go for a run every morning, which is one of my super habits, is to get my activation where it needs to be and get the right neurotransmitters into my brain so that when I sit at my desk, I can do my clever, focused work first thing. The reason that I write a written reflection at the end of the day is because I want to de-stress my brain and start reducing my activation levels so that when I get into bed, I'm more likely to be in the right activation level to go to sleep. So this thing drives our life, yet most people never thought about it. But that's why it's central in the book. Awesome. And so in the end of the day reflection that you write, how long is that typically? So we've got some different tools that I used to do that. And again, I, they're all explained in the book. They're on the continuum. One is three to one reflection. So three helpful or positive things. One thing I can do even better tomorrow, two minutes, all the way through. And well, next step would be having a wabba, which is a written eight brain argument where you just write down all the things you're thinking about. The longest form is expressive writing, which, you know, you could be spending uh, 20, 30 minutes doing that. Depends what your day is like, but, you know, typically five minutes at the end of the day, write it down. I try to write down as many helpful things as I can, as mundane as I might feel. And therefore you are, it's like you are landscaping your brain and your experiences and your memories, and you are fine tuning your thinking habits. So you're getting better at making yourself instinctively pay attention to the helpful things. And and actually, the heart of the book and the heart of what I understand about helping people to build better habits is what we're trying to do, the pinnacle of the habit we're trying to create is what's called implicit emotional regulation. That means we can turn emotional regulation into a habit. And what I've seen is that the better you are at regulating yourself, the easier life is, the easier it is to be healthy, happy, at your best, help others to be at their best. So that's really the center of the book, but that can sound a little bit intangible. No, I mean, there's so much here. So, and I love the reflection at the end of the day, because it kind of puts a cap on it, it kind of closes it. And I love the way you're using that as a transition. Many years ago, I heard a story of a young man who was invited by his boss to come over and have dinner with his family the boss's family. 
And as the two of them walked up the walkway to the front door of the home, um, his boss had a briefcase in one hand. Those were the old days. And with his other hand, he reached up and he touched the limb of the tree. And then um, his boss, who was this super intense, hard driving guy, then went inside and was transformed into this super nice, loving, patient guy as his kids climbed all over him and yada, yada. And they had this wonderful meal. And when they came out at the end of the evening, the young man turned to him and he said, so um, I'm curious. I noticed when you uh, uh, walked and I think, I think he may have spent the night. And the next morning they walked out and he noticed as the boss walked out, he touched the tree limb again. So as they're driving to work, he asked him, he said, so what's, what, why do you touch the tree limb when you, when you go into the house and come out? And his boss smiled and he said, well, when I walk in, I touch the tree limb, I put all my work up on the tree and I don't give it another thought. And when I come out in the morning, I reach up to the tree and I take it back. And it's kind of like what you're saying with the reflection exercise, that it's a tool to train my brain to let go so then I can enjoy the evening and then hopefully sleep better. Is it, am I reading you right? Am I hearing you right? Yeah. So at a high level, it's like drawing a line in the sand at the end of the day. And that's become more important as we have got forced to work from home. But yeah, we're describing a habit loop. And our habit loop is the trait model. So you've got the trigger, which touching the, the tree is, is the trigger. And you've got the routine, which is probably calming yourself down, putting the dad face on, etc. You've got, which is unique in our model, which is the eight brain incentive. What incentivizes your limbic regions to behave in that way? That's why I find most other, well, I find all other habit models quite confusing because I the reward bit doesn't really make sense. It's, it's kind of counterintuitive. But um, what what's what's in it for your limbic regions of your brain? And the final step in our model is training. So the more you practice that, the more automatic it becomes. So the first time you touch the tree, it might have been quite difficult, you know, to get dad face on and to leave everything behind. But the more you practice it, the better you got at it. Because that's how habits work. It's about developing new neurobiological connections in your brain. The more you develop, the more automatic the behavior becomes. And if you stop practicing it, you'll develop another habit. You'll develop the thing that you are practicing consciously or, or, or unconsciously. Oh, yeah. Good point. And we could do a whole podcast on that. But I want to ask one question, and I want to take a little risk here. So years ago, I read about we're staying in professional golf, which is strange because I don't play golf. But Tiger Woods, you know, hit the scene, winning every tournament, and then he ran into a slump took some time off, worked with his coach. The way I read it, and you're welcome to correct me, is that when he worked with his coach, I asked my clients, what do you think he worked on? His bad habits, you know, his weak areas or his strong areas? And what I read, if I'm remembering correctly, was that they spent 80% of their time on the strong areas, which I think were long game and putting, and then 20% of the time on the weak areas, which were um, short game and sand traps, I, I think. And the argument was that his coach wanted to make his strengths, his best habits, so strong, nobody could touch him. And they only spent enough time on the weak habits, so they didn't hurt him. He didn't lose strokes, but they didn't try to make it so he gained strokes. I don't know whether you're aware of that. If you are, tell me whether I'm right or wrong. But more importantly, what do you think about this argument about how much time should we spend on our strong habits? versus addressing our weak ones. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, and I'm sure that's an absolutely true story. The thing for Tiger Woods is he could drive most green, so that's the only two clubs you need if he's <laughs> Tiger, he's driving his putter. But for someone like Tiger, this is always individual. Tiger Woods is clearly a perfectionist. That's how he gets so good. So you can see how perfectionists get bogged down in the stuff they're not good at. And it has a disproportionately negative effect to someone who's maybe not a perfectionist. Like in Ernie Els, you know, that they're two great counter examples in the game at the, at the same time, winning majors, but very stylistically very different. So I think that the way we frame it in the book is you have a set of super habits. So you can develop a set of super habits. But if you get if you if you if you activate or if you if you develop the super habits, they activate loads of other helpful behavior. So just by getting some things right every day, 
it has a really good positive effect on other things. So one of my super habits is going for a run in the morning. Another one is planning the day. Another one is reflecting at the end of the day. If I get those three things right, I'm going to have pretty good days because they're activating lots of other helpful habits as well. And I think you can also take your point, David, at an organizational level. So I work a lot with CEO, C-suite. The biggest problem for the majority of businesses is, is change management. And what I've seen is most change management doesn't work anymore. It's outdated. It's not based on good science. And one of the things that we get wrong in change management is we rely too much on conscious behavior. We think if people know what they should do, they will do it. That's not how we operate. We operate on mindless, unconscious behavior. And one of the things I really encourage my C-suite people to be thinking about, which is very counterintuitive, they always go for where's the biggest problem? Where's the biggest, who are the people that are not going to do this? Who can't we change? Don't worry about them. Worry about your best people and supercharge them because they're going to move everyone else in the right direction. And the guys that are at that end of the continuum, don't worry about them because they'll just fall out of the business or you, can, you don't have enough time and resource to manage them. Help your better people become better. And I think in a way that's what Tiger Woods, if Tiger Woods' golf game was a team that decided to make the best players on the team, he's driving and he's putting even better. And then that brings up Woods' confidence you build change momentum, which is the key in, in building habits, just getting some success and some wins, and then everything else gets better. So, you know, habits are more central than I think any of us have previously understood. They are driving our societies. They are driving our businesses. They are driving our family units. They are driving how we, inter- how we are interpreting this conversation now. They are everywhere. And the more we can understand them, and proactively manage them to help ourselves, our families, our people to be at their best, the easier it's going to be to be healthy, happy, and successful and achieve all that great stuff that we want to achieve in our life. Maybe not winning 18 major championships, but, you know. Well, but, but that's not necessary to have a fulfilling life. So no. I, lo- I love where you're coming from. Um, this really, I agree with you. I, this is a book that needs to be read cover to cover with a highlighter. Uh, so then once a month, you can go back and s- scan it and say, okay, where do I need to pick up my game? And uh, if they want to learn more about what you're doing, Dr. Finn, um, obviously they pick up the, the habit mechanic. I did go and it looks like you got an app coming out, right? It's going to be a habit mechanic app. Yes. Yeah, so we've got a habit mechanic app coming out um, just to supercharge the habit building process. Yeah. If you go to our website, tougherminds.co.uk, loads of free resources on there. Um, now, wait a minute, slow that down. What is the website? Uh, Tougher Minds, which is my consultancy. So Tougher, which is T-O-U-G-H-E-R-M-I-N-D-S, tougherminds.co.uk, not .com. Um, loads of free resources on there. And you can see what we do. You know, We work with a range of people from elite, big global businesses, all the way through to you know smaller startups. We also work in education. We work in elite sport from Premier League football all the way through. We work with individuals, families. We're just passionate about helping people to be at their best. And ultimately, habits are at the center of that. And we can all learn to build better ones. That's great. Tougherminds.co. Check out the habit mechanic. Um, Dr. Finn, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. And thank you to everyone for listening. <laughs>